It is now my pleasure to announce our next session, a weed out from the COP26 from Glasgow, Lessons Learned for the Green Transformation with Maria Fernanda Espinosa, Nick Butch and Parag Panna that will be moderated by our executive director, Noah Müller. With this, over to Noah and the speakers for the next session. Liana, thank you very much and a very warm welcome to all of you to our discussion on lessons learned for the green transformation. Our session obviously couldn't be timelier right after the COP26 and therefore I am extremely pleased to have with me here on site Maria Espinosa, whom you know as the former president of the UNGA and also the former minister of foreign affairs of her home country, Ecuador. Maria also has a long career and extensive experience in climate and also in sustainable development. Maria, it's great to have you here on site. Thank you. With us also on this panel is Parak Khanna. Parak is a good friend. Um, he's also a very keen observer of global trends and he's also the founder and managing director of FutureMap, a strategic advisory company. As you can see on the video, Parak has just authored a book which is called Move, The Forces Uprooting Us and we'll get to talk about that a little later. And last but certainly not least, tuning in from London is Nick Bridge. Nick is the special representative for the or of the UK Foreign Secretary for Climate Change. Um, has been a very busy man in the past um, weeks and months. It's great to have you with us. And Nick Bridge um, can share with us his fresh impressions from Glasgow. What we will do in the next 45 minutes or so is we will discuss the outcome, obviously, of COP26, but more importantly, also the way ahead. And we want to focus on the consequences of climate change when it comes to mega trends such as migration, development, and also security. And also important, we would like to hear from you, from the three of you, what you expect in terms of the new German government, which in all likelihood will also have a green component. We'll come to that later on. But Maria, let me come to you first here with us in, in Berlin. You've attended so many COPs. So in terms of COP26, what's your take? Was the glass rather half full or half empty? Well, it depends on the perspective, uh, Nora, and I'm so thrilled to be uh, in presence, uh, you know, at this foreign policy forum in its 10th edition, uh, I learned. Uh, going to your question, I, I think that there were important gains at COP26, COP but also disappointment. And I, and I think that we have to be, uh, you know, outspoken uh, about it. Uh, in terms of the gains, I, I have to say that for the first time, I think that the climate headlines were more prominent than the COVID headlines uh, during COP26, which means uh, great polit uh, uh, public uh, profile of the discussion, great society engagement, academia, civil society, youth, uh, connected to the climate debate. Not only it was an issue of climate negotiators or, or scientists, it was society being concerned about climate. And, and I think that was a, a very a positive uh, uh, outcome, I would say, of the process of COP. Uh, number two, uh, as uh, you know, it's I don't know how many COPs I have attended as a negotiator of, of my country, but I have to say that after Paris, we were, you know, without sleep for a couple of weeks there. Uh, we, it took us five years 
to finalize the Paris rulebook, the rules of the game, the kind of roadmap for implementation of the Paris Agreement. And that was one of the big uh, good outcomes of, of COP26, agreement in carbon markets, agreement in, in uh, common frameworks for national determined contributions, uh, the accountability framework. So uh, these are not minor things. Uh, in, in if you want to look at the uh, challenges, I would say, and the disappointment uh, parts, it's the weaker language on the facing out coal versus facing down um, unabated coal. I think it makes a big difference when you're talking about mitigation, uh, a very weak language in loss and damage, which is critical for small island developing states and the most vulnerable countries. And, and I would say, uh, strong pledges on climate finance, but a little bit of a, uh, I would say, chaos and lack of clarity on how much money, where and when, uh, and I think that we lacked that certainty and in, in that order uh, in, in the climate uh, finance pledges uh, during COP26, but we can come back to discussing uh, further, but... Uh, we sure will. Thank you so much, Maria, and it remains to be seen whether those pledges will really be implemented. I mean, that's, that's the always point. The, the $1 million question. But um, let's go to, to London, Nick Bridge, if I could, and actually ask you the same question. Was the glass half full or half empty? I have a sense what your answer might be, but um, still, <laughs> was it really a breakthrough or was it just blah, 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 as some people thought? <laughs> Well, I agree with Maria that we can just have a really honest, you know, assessment, and it's it's uh, it's. I'm very happy to to have that debate. I think, you know, uh, we did keep the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, temperature warming limit goal alive. We 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 really um, saw, if you look back a year or two, a pretty extraordinary shift in commitment. Now we'll go on to discuss then implementation of that commitment, but the, let, let me just you know, remind that before Paris and that historic agreement five or six years ago, we were on track uh, according to commitments for well over three degrees Celsius, catastrophe yeah. for the planet and Absolutely. for civilization. And uh, coming out of Glasgow, we are looking at just a little bit over two degrees trajectory. So that is an enormous shift. Uh, when we took up the presidency, we had about a quarter or less than a quarter of the world on a net zero uh, commitment, a net zero pathway. And coming out of COP, we now have more than 90% of the world uh, committed to that net zero target. So we've got to do a lot more, a lot more to get the 2030 uh, reduction in emissions uh, that we need, according to the science. The risks are impossible to overstate if we can't do that uh, for everybody, but obviously for the poorest and most vulnerable countries first. So we took an all-out approach as the presidency. We pushed really hard in the last year or two diplomatically around the world with partners. So we've got that big net zero commitment. We got a lot of improvement on 2030 numbers, but not enough, especially from the bigger emitters. Uh, but as Maria said, getting the rule book done was essential. It was a real baseline of success. It was very challenging, but we've got those carbon market rules, those adaptation rules. On loss and, loss and damage, we really made progress with making this Santiago network a real thing. Um, and there was then the whole point at the beginning with the more than 120 leaders of the world who gathered, committing to a much bigger emphasis on the role of nature in all of this. Oh, 140 countries signing mm -hmm. up to protecting and restoring 90% of the world's forests by 2030. So a really you know, historic uh, breakthrough. We did just to quickly mention a couple of other key, key, key stats in the financial system. If you could system, do that like in a very sort of uh, brief time frame, Nick, sorry to in interrupt the financial, you. In the financial system, the private sector now, $130 trillion of assets are committed to be net zero. 
and in the um, real economy, in the innovation sector, Glasgow breakthroughs, which mean that all of the clean stuff, all the clean technology will be the most accessible, the most affordable by 2030. So, so we try to go all out. We've got a lot more work to do. We're presidency for another year, so we're really keen to keep pressing on with all partners. But I think big steps, uh, but, but as Maria said, it, we've made a huge shift in the commitment, the irreversible commitment. It's now about, as we've said now, you know, for some time, uh, then showing that we're going to implement those commitments. Absolutely. And this is a good moment to, to bring in Parag. Um, Parag, I wanted you to, uh, to sort of zoom out a little bit and help us take a look at the macro level. Um, in, in your new book, um, which I mentioned in the beginning, um, you argue that the map of humanity isn't settled, not now and not never, and not ever. And um, one of the things that you put down is that climate change combined with a number of other factors um, will actually lead to an unprecedented age of migration and mobility. That's your kind of your core argument. So I wonder from, from a futurist's perspective, I think I can call you a, a futurist, um, do you think that this is just a reality that we have to um, face up to, the reality of the homo mobilis, if you will, or is there still talking about the implementation also of commitments made at COP26, is there still a way for us to prevent such a, well, at least, if not a worst, but a very bad case scenario, right? Thank you so much, Nora, and uh, congratulations to all of you on your 10th anniversary event. I look forward to the next time when I can be in Berlin uh, in person. And I want to echo the positive momentum, the sentiments uh, that Maria and Nick have, uh, have made. You know, clearly this COP26 brought forward a lot more, you know, energy and up the game, if you will. It, you know, obviously people will debate whether it was sufficient, but Time will, time will tell, but clearly the role of the private sector has been stronger in, uh, in this COP, you know, sort of iteration than any previous instance, and that does track to even a broader global momentum around the issue of uh, climate change mitigation. And the work that I've been focused on is on adaptation, and I think that this, what this part of the significance of this COP26 is that that sharp divide in the resources committed to mitigation efforts versus what you might even call the neglect of adaptation is that that's been somewhat bridged. It's been bridged in the talk and it's been bridged in the promises of action for the future. And I think that's very, very important for a number of reasons. First of all, even if we were to make even stronger progress than, uh, than what we have made, on genuinely, in a confirmed way, you know, bending down the curve around emissions, around projected temperature rise. The fact is that displacement, the displacement of people from climate change is already an enormously profound reality today. In this century so far, more people have been displaced internally or internationally from climate factors than from political or economic ones. That's the first century in which this has happened. If you go back to, the, or you know, that we, in, in recent memory or recorded times, if you look at the migration figures, as I've documented rather carefully, from the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th centuries, there's a balance of the role that economic factors, demograph uh, uh, political factors, conflict-related, and other sorts of drivers have had on human migration. But of course, climate has now returned, if you will, it's in a very, very big way. And we're very early in this century, so there's no question that climate displacement is real, it's growing. And the fact is that, you know, no matter what positive momentum we generate around the mitigation efforts, we have an obligation to help people today, billions of people, cope with the reality of climate change, whether it is floods, whether it is droughts, whether it is wildfires, heat waves, rising sea levels. And therefore, in a way, part of how you almost framed it, Nora, you know, almost gives the impression that 
you know, movement is, you know, a, a negative consequence of climate change and therefore, um, you know, keeping the map as it is, the map of human geography as it is, is the metric by which we should measure success. You know, can people stay where they are? That's not the argument I would make in the sense that I believe mobility is good. Mobility is part of what it means to be human. Mar mobility is intimate to our history as a species. Mobility is how we came to be where we are. Mobility is part and parcel of our adaptation story wherever we live in the world. And so we should constantly be optimizing our geography to cope with circumstances. We, we are mammals. We have a fight or flight instinct in a way. And you don't want to be fighting against nature. You want to be adapting to nature. So I would like to see this, you know, at the end of COP26, this very powerful promise that, you know, half a future climate-related investment would be de devoted to and directed towards adaptation measures. I really hope that that comes true. There's a very, very long list of adaptations, whether it's infrastructural investment, relocation, or other kinds of measures. So I think that we are moving in the right direction in that sense, but part of the response has to be helping everyone alive today to adapt. Uh, and, and adaptation can, to a large degree, mean migration. Thank Park, you. thanks very much, and thank you for, for making that point very clear. Um, if I could ask you to go a little further into the idea of adaptation. I know in your book there are some fascinating examples of what adaptation means in very concrete terms. So, so maybe you could, um, you could say a couple of words on that. Sure, I'll just be very brief because, again, this is one of the areas where we have technology, but we don't necessarily have scale. If people are going to remain where they are, and if they're agricultural, you know, sort of workers, farmers, what are we doing to provide them with more efficient drip irrigation technology? What are we doing to spread genetically modified seeds or drought-resistant seeds? These kinds of things. When it comes to um, issues such as, uh, uh, you know, also, again, water scarcity, what are we doing around desalination, uh, direct air capture, uh, these kinds of things. So there's a lot of things we can do in different places. When it comes to urban environments, uh, floodplains for coastal cities, uh, also building retrofitting, heating and insulation, especially for places that are experiencing a lot of heat stress. Those are yet more examples of, you know, again, technological interventions where the capacity, uh, the knowledge is there today, but we haven't scaled them. When it comes to uh, housing, uh, one of the things that I've emphasized is modular and movable housing. So 3D printed, flat packed, kinds of homes that are literally movable. Could be literally a, a trailer home, RV homes, container homes. Um, and we can do these things in order to provide for not just thousands, but millions of people in vulnerable locations and help them to resettle in uh, with the kind of infrastructure that keeps a sort of roof over one's head. What are we doing in terms of more hydroponic, aquaponic, uh, food generation technologies, greenhouses, and so forth? So again, the list is so, so long and can be categorized and sort of in typologies and all of the kinds of interventions for aspects of daily life, depending on the environmental conditions of different places. So this is where, you know, the money needs to also be going. When people say we need Manhattan projects for climate mitigation, I agree. We also need that scale of investment for adaptation. Thanks so much for, for making that point and for giving us also some concrete examples. I see Nick nodding in, in London. Nick, my question to you would be based on what Parag was just saying. Of course, we should also embrace kind of the, 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 the what Parag framed as positive effects of, of climate change or see them as an opportunity. At the same time, I think there's no denying that there is a nexus also between climate change and security challenges. So I thought that um, this was something which was missing on the agenda of COP26. And um, I was wondering whether you think that um, this is an, an issue that also should be put on the agenda of COP27 in, in Cairo. Well, it's implicit in everything we were doing at COP26, if not, as you say, explicit, in the sense that, you know, we put enormous effort into those three things. You've got to mitigate, you've got to get those emissions down and bend that curve dramatically. 
we've done the beginnings of that. You've got to put more emphasis, as Parag says, on adaptation, that it's happening now. It's much, much more than uh, people are uh, ready for. Uh, we are really lacking uh, preparedness for adaptation, so we put a huge effort into that. And then in order to do that, the third big focus was the finance. We uh, very regrettably missed this obligation to deliver the 100 billion by 2020. But uh, as the presidency, we achieved a huge uplift in the last year, despite COVID, of getting most donor countries to double their commitment. And so in the five years following 2020, we hope to have a $500 billion flow through. But I also mentioned that critical private sector point, as Parag also said, we gave a huge emphasis on matching behaviour in the negotiating room. The only way you raise the ambition in between governments is that the private sector in the real economy and the private sector in the financial system is asking governments for the certainty, asking governments for the ambition so they can plan. So I think implicit in our emphasis on uh, ambitious mitigation, uh, more emphasis on adaptation and more money for both, was the reality of the climate insecurity that you've just referred to, that we fully agree with. I mean, if you look at Afghanistan, every province currently is suffering from drought, 10 million people Hunger. in the country facing those extremes already. We heard from Parag about the numbers of climate-affected um, uh, uh, livelihoods, that arc of instability right around, uh, around Europe, in Central uh, America, across Australia, across Asia, everywhere you look. Uh, we are only just beginning to understand the scale of the risk. And remember that the IPCC analysis, which has been so crucial in getting everybody's awareness up and on the risks of 1.5 and of 2 degrees of warming, remember that that doesn't uh, factor in um, the cascading risks, the, the greater aggregation of risks, the potential tipping points. We may already have entered uh, some of these um, Earth system shifts. So we cannot understate, as I said at the beginning, we cannot overstate the risks that we're not yet managing. So we have to go all out. You know, in our next year, uh, coming a bit onto Germany, obviously with the G7 presidency and the new government coming in, we'll be wanting to really double down that partnership and recognize, you know, that um, we have to do more as a G20, as the leading countries who are emitting both historically and now and in future. This is where the action's got to be. Otherwise, we will not be managing those risks, which will affect all of us. Nick, thanks very much for mentioning the various fora where climate action can be pushed forward. And I do want to come back to that point. But Maria, um, back to you here, here on site with me. Um, what we have seen in, in Glasgow is the, the Sino-American Glasgow Declaration on enhancing climate action, which was good news um, to many of us. So on, on, on the backdrop of that, I wanted to ask you whether you think that climate action can actually be an opportunity for um, great powers uh, who do compete with each other to work together, or would you say that great power competition is actually something that inhibits cooperation on, on climate issues? I would say both, uh, Nora, and, and I have to say that uh, this either or, either coalition of the willing, the G20, or, you know, a universal pact on climate justice. And, and I think it's a little bit of the two. It's extremely important that the G20 delivers strong commitments on finance, on mitigation. Uh, I cannot agree more on the need to scale up um, uh, investment on adaptation and resilience building in, in the global south. And I also uh, agree, and I think it's a great argument that Parag sh shared with us on the idea that at the end of the day, migration is the ultimate adaptation response. But migration has always to be uh, you know, an option and not an obligation. So I just wanted to re react to that and come back to the idea of either coalition of the willing or universal multilateralism. And I would say we need both. Uh, on, on one side, uh, we, we need to have the big emitters uh, uh, come to grips and agree on, on major breakthrough um, uh, efforts. But on the other hand, we also need a balanced, um, I would say, fair, accountable, legitimate, global universal agreement. And that only happens 
under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, under Conference of the Parties, under the 197 uh, parties uh, to the convention. It's extremely important that everybody feels that they have their share of rights and responsibilities. It's absolutely uh, critical. And, um, and that is, uh, I, I think the, the best example is on the climate finance front. And I cannot agree more uh, with, uh, with Nick when he said, you know, there's a long way to go. We haven't delivered on the 100 billion that were already agreed in Cancun more than 10 years ago. And then it's written black and white in the Paris Agreement. Um, just let's remember that 7% of the total climate funding goes to adaptation and all the rest to mitigation. So th there is a, a balance outcome that needs to come out, uh, a universal uh, uh, agreement, uh, an accountable one, a transparent one. And, uh, and I think that would also um, mean that we need uh, to have, a, 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 um, I would say, a climate finance uh, framework that is understandable for all. Uh, good news, the 130 trillion from the private sector. Good news, the 20 billion for nature-based solutions, uh, reforestation and uh, uh, ecosystem restoration. Very important for the Amazon, you know, uh, for, uh, for where I come from, etc. <laughs> but uh, we need to know what is private, uh, what is public funding, what goes to adaptation and resilience resilience building, what goes to mitigation. We need that clarity so accountability and transparency can operate. And that happens under the umbrella of the Convention on Climate Change, of the Conference of the Parties. So it's, uh, we have a lot of homework to do. That's always good. And what I hear from you, Maria, is a very strong plea for, for clarity. Um, now, there has been a lot of talk about multi-stakeholderism also when it comes to climate action, climate finance. And when I listen to you, I get the feeling actually multi-stakeholderism bringing also in the private sector has worked fairly well. Would you, would you agree with that assessment? Well, I, I think one of the weak points of the multilateral architecture is how you bring in, for example, the voice of civil society, mm. how you bring in the voice, the agency, and the co-responsibility from the uh, private sector. And I would say that we are still lacking an overall umbrella. Uh, and that, I think, helps a lot in terms of the fear that some countries with reason sometimes have in terms of conflict of interest, etc. So I, I think that in all this wave of UN reform, of inclusive and networked multilateralism, these are the issues that we need to seriously discuss. And this is the time to do it. Uh, I'm uh, uh, very positive and optimistic about the Our Common Agenda report, for example. But these are things that we, we need to fix in the multilateral system. We cannot uh, have the same design as we had 76 years ago. The world has changed, so institutions need to adapt, including the United Nations. That's a very important point and a question, a ball, so to speak, Parak, that I wanted to throw into your court here. What do you think is the right way to sort of um, go by climate action in the framework of a multilateral um, setting. So um, multilateralism by definition means that you bring in as many actors as possible, but there's also the view that we should um, proceed with smaller formations, kind of mini lateralist um, uh, constellations by climate clubs, um, basically speaking. So what's your take? What's the right way to go, or is is the is that a wrong question? Because there is no black and white eventually. Well, there's no black and white. There's also no one size fits all. So depending on what aspect of climate mitigation adaptation we're talking about, there is going to be a different, you know, appropriate formula, and there won't be an agreement on what the most appropriate formula is for whatever issue. When you think about when we use the term climate club today, you know, that already has very, you know, negative, almost aggressive connotations for a number of countries because people worry about, um, you know, border adjustment taxes 
prices and carbon markets and this kind of thing. So already we need to be careful. Multilateralism does not necessarily denote global. You know, it's, it can be different kinds of configurations. When it comes to adaptation measures, it could be that regionalism, you know, regional formations are more appropriate. Certainly when it comes to migration, most migration is intra-regional, within regions or within hemispheres, let's yeah. say. And since we don't have a global migration accord, certainly not a binding one, and perhaps never will, it's to be expected that countries are going to wind up making adjustments on a more regional level in terms of what population flows are occurring and how to go about dealing with them. And they're probably not going to want to, you know, be dictated to, let's say, you know, by, uh, by multilateral uh, bodies. So I think for every single issue, we're going to see a different kind of pattern emerge. If we look at energy and technology transfer, there's a lot in technology transfer that most certainly is global. If you think about solar power and um, you know electric vehicles and, and uh, all sorts of other technological interventions have scale globally. But when it comes to large scale changes in electricity grids and, and you know, power generation and these kinds of things, um, a lot of those technologies are done in a much more regional way in the sense that countries are connecting grids to each other across borders with neighbors, and that's helping to reduce energy costs. Um, that's certainly what's happening with gas. If you consider that a bridge fuel, it's certainly what's happening with um, gas to hydrogen kinds of projects that's happening within Asia. Certainly what's happening with nuclear. If you think about the places where nuclear is sort of coming back and where, of course, you will have cross-border uh, you know, nuclear power sharing. So when it, it comes down to each of these specific use cases or issues and how we want to go about solving it and what type of multilateral arrangement is going to be the most supportive of that. So the bottom line is, in terms of my answer, is that this should be open-ended, right? We should always look to have a role for multilateral bodies in every one of these issues. But the answer to which organization doing what in what way, there is no you know, black and white answer to that. Thanks very much, Park. Also, thank you for mentioning different sources of energy and also mentioning the kind of renaissance of nuclear energy. That's something I wanted to ask Nick about. But before I do so, let me read out a question that we received from our viewers. Here it comes. And Parak, maybe that's the one that, that you want to share your thoughts about. When talking about the future, for you being as a futurist, um, it will have to be a digital and green future. What proposals do you consider should be presented to the digital transformation mm -hmm. and the challenges it presents for the green transition considering the energy expenditure? That's a fair question and that mm -hmm. question was posed by Monica Laborda. What do you make of that, Parag? It's an excellent question. I mean, I would answer it first and foremost from a data science or geospatial standpoint, which is to say that we are gathering more data. That's a digital exercise. You know, the sensor networks that we're deploying uh, all across our uh, built environment, across the, the, the planet, and obviously atmospherically are enormously useful. I was just reading earlier today about uh, efforts by um, uh, IT companies to do a full digital twinning you know, of the world and of the complex system that our environment is. And there's been incredible progress in that from just, uh, you know, say five, six years ago when universities were just beginning to harness their resources, um, you know, to try to do complex modeling of, of the atmosphere and its impact on our local ecologies. This digital twinning is vastly more sophisticated. So we've come a long way. And that's a uh, obviously, you know, sort of tech related, IT related, data related, uh, digital answer. We obviously want to, again, you know, use that data in ways that improve efficiency and conservation. And I think we can all agree, and I think we all know, that there's such an unbelievable amount of waste in you know, so many of our social and economic uh, systems and practices that by monitoring that data and finding ways to automate conservation, um, you know, sort of, you know, lights off and, and all of these kinds, you know, obviously uh, the street lights, power grids, uh, uh, load sharing, you know, all of these things that we can do to reduce power consumption. So again, in, in every aspect of our daily lives, 
uh, data can help us be more efficient. Um, so I think you know that's just a, a sort of preliminary uh, answer. But but you know of course and then and then there is the obviously it would be you know I'd be remiss you know not mentioning that uh, our digital economy itself is a major consumer of power, right? A major drain in many Absolutely. ways. Absolutely. And, and so it is part of the solution. Yes. It's also part of the problem. So we need to be mindful of that as we think about uh, you know, the role of, uh, of digital technology. Absolutely. And again, thanks for bringing in the issue of, of nuclear power. Nick, over to you. Um, President Macron of France recently claimed that um, reinventing nuclear power is the solution. Rolls-Royce also develops um, small modular reactors. So are we seeing a renaissance of nuclear power? And um, to quote a question from, from our viewers here, do we actually need nuclear power to keep global temperatures on a sustainable level? Every country will take its, its pathway that makes sense for, for it. I mean, if you look, you know, at how closely integrated the, the British, the French, the German and other European economies are, yet look at our energy uh, sources, radically different sources. So uh, we have nuclear, we have gas, but we have an extraordinary growth in offshore wind in the UK because that's the path that the pricing has taken us down. We had 40 percent of coal in our mix about seven or eight years ago. Five years later, zero, because offshore wind, uh, we set up some contracts for difference. We did some emissions limits. We did some carbon trading, carbon pricing, carbon levies. And lo and behold, the price of offshore wind, when it went to scale and it's falling all the time, went down by a third. So nuclear is still part of that mix. We've still got plans for nuclear. Many other countries have pl big plans for nuclear. And I would just say, though, probably in the overall marketplace, I think we're seeing even bigger plans on the um, uh, wind and solar side. Uh, and then, as we noted, uh, as Maria said, you know, some, uh, certainly coal is on its way out. And, um, you know, all the fossil fuel subsidies we're also looking at now. And the aim of the breakthrough at Glasgow, the Glasgow breakthroughs, was just to simply say, you know, you don't need to uh, pick and choose a single energy source you need to look at the marketplace look at the pricing and make sure the clean stuff is uh, not discriminated against is it has a framework and a regulatory framework in which it can flourish and be the main source of of, of power so I, I hope i haven't side skipped your question uh, it wasn't my intention well, you, kind of uh, have. I think, you know countries will choose that <laughs> will choose their pathway so, so I mean, the, the big question, of course, what is considered clean? What what is considered clean clean energy? Um, no, I, I, so so what I hear from you is you, that you don't necessarily see a renaissance of nuclear power, but leave it to each and every country to kind of decide about its own energy mix. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it works. It works in the UK. It works in some other places and not in other places. And of course, there's not just the marketplace here, there's a political backdrop and a, and a context. And, um, you know, uh, we've been discussing closely with our friends and colleagues in Japan, you know, in post Fukushima, how it makes its energy security uh, work in, in, in the years ahead and looking at what they're planning. I also just wanted to, if you don't mind, just, I did just want to jump in on the back of the very important points that were made about multilateralism as a, as a, as a as a diplomat and uh, somebody who's looking at the geopolitics, the way that the clean story is just transforming uh, the way we need to think about our uh, institutions. And I just want to, I'm sorry to have so much agreement across this panel, um, but uh, I really, no uh, you know, benefited from the points that both colleagues made. You know, what we tried to do at COP was do a really deep analysis of what changes the market to a clean, yeah. to a clean market and what governments need to do. So, if it's coal finance, you know, we worked really hard through the G7 and then with others and eventually with China to uh, stop the international financing of coal. With carbon markets, we've now got that in place. We need to work really, really rapidly. With the, with the car markets, the automotive sector, you just need those top manufacturers to make that decision, the end of the combustion engine, which we've agreed in the UK is 2030. And then the market switches to cheaper, more sustainable, and so on. Sustainable supply chains is another area where actually we brought together the first proper dialogue between producer and consumer nations, who, those who are both, you know, um, producing the goods and, and consuming the goods. So multilateralism, absolutely, you need every country at the UN table, every country, and every 
group, the, the young people uh, were the ones who moved this debate forward substantially a couple of years ago, and need to, we need to keep listening. The, the indigenous peoples and the vulnerable people, we need to listen to more than anything. And then we, we, we basically then have a number of ways to we manage the different problems. Uh, all, all of us need to be involved, all of society. Multilateralism works at many different levels. So that was definitely the intention with the mm. presidency. A very strong plea for multilateralism that you can't argue with. Maria, you're not only a um, former foreign minister of your country and a former president of the UNGA, but you're also a very keen Germany watcher. So <laughs> I wanted to um, pass on a question that we've um, received via our, our live stream um, on the future of of Germany's policy, in fact, and this is what this whole conference is all about. And what one viewer wants to know is whether the participation of the Green Party, the potential participation of the Green Party in the new German government will result in substantial new commitments. How optimistic are you? Well, I would say I'm optimistic in, in especially, I don't know how uh, the uh, final agreement uh, with uh, uh, would look like, but we pretty much know. We'll and, know it's uh, yes, <laughs> and, uh, and basically uh, expectations are very high. I think that the role of Europe is absolutely critical. How this uh, new, new uh, Green Deal is going to be operationalized, what we have seen in terms of the trillions invested in, in recovery, in pandemic recovery, the, we really need to make sure that investment go to low carbon sectors. Uh, I think the role of Germany is critical. Uh, it has a, um, a, a very important voice within the European Union, but all, uh, also in the global scenario. I would say we, we have high expectations of having Germany having a strong and loud voice in terms of the necessary Uh, ecological transition, uh, I think also into a call of You know, I, I think we, we really need to rethink our high carbon life, lifestyles uh, in a way. And, and, and I think that uh, uh, Germany is a very strong player and has and needs to have a stronger voice within Europe and, and outside Europe uh, uh, as well. Uh, here, I think that we need um, um, what I, the voice of the global south here, uh, a direct conversation and interaction, not only at the government level, but among civil society, north and south, indigenous peoples, women, that are all part of uh, climate solutions. Uh, we need to put a, a strong human face to the climate crisis, and I think these issues are of extreme uh, relevance. Thank you very much for mentioning this at the very end of this intriguing conversation. Um, we have less than one minute left, so let me thank all the three of you for a very engaging conversation. Thank you, Maria, to you here on site, to Nick in London, and to Parak in Singapore. Um, thank you all for watching, and please stay tuned. We will continue with a final session for today after a 30-minute break, and in that next session, we will have a spotlight interview with Omid Nuripur, who certainly also has some thoughts on the future of the green transformation. Thank you all and see you later.